Our Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 10, verses 12 through 22. So now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? Only to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his decrees that I am commanding you today for your own well-being. Although heaven and the heaven of heavens belong to the Lord your God, the earth with all that is in it, yet the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all the people as it is today. Circumcise then the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, <clears throat> who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. Him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the heaven. And then from the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself Unstained, unstained by the world. And now would you stand as you're able for the gospel lesson from the book of Matthew, um, chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. Then the little children were being brought to him in order that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples spoke sternly to those who brought them, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of heaven belongs. And he laid his hands on them and went on his way. The word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. And let us pray. Almighty God, pour your spirit upon us as we hear your word this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless, says James. It's a pretty scathing statement, but I think it describes much of Christianity today, all talk, all the time. On the other hand, he says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It seems odd that out of all, out of all, the, all, out of all the things that we might categorize as making up religion, especially Christian religion, James leads with the care of orphans and widows. Now, some commentators say that James is making a specific contrast to the violent re uh, religion of Jewish revolutionaries who, like many religious people today, believe that faith in its defense is primarily about wielding political power. Instead, James says that the true gauge of religious power is how we deal with the powerless. In a world where we like to talk, James is more concerned about what we do. And this is not unique to James, as our other scriptures reveal this morning. Psalm 82, which was our call to worship, connects God's judgment to the way his people treat the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. 
Deuteronomy 10 reminds Israel that God will execute his justice on behalf of the vulnerable. And Jesus welcomes children, the most vulnerable of all people, because the kingdom of God belongs to those like them. This is just a sampling in the scriptures of the many, many times God reveals his preference, his justice, his protection for those who need it most. And that's one of the reasons why I was excited when our missions team chose to embrace the support of orphans as a major focus of our church. Whatever's happening in the culture, whatever happens with court decisions, all those kinds of things, we're Christians, and this is our first job, to care for those who are vulnerable, however they become vulnerable. This is a step toward the pure religion of which James speaks, but it's also a mission that once it gets inside you, gives you a desire to do more, to have more of God, more of compassion for those whom God has compassion. And that was certainly my experience when I traveled to Romania at the end of May. I went to Romania with uh, my mentor and friend, Randy Jessen, who is uh, executive director of Global Hope, and another pastor friend, Dave York, who I've known for years. And the three of us flew from Denver to Frankfurt and then on to Budapest, Hungary, where we got into a car with Pastor Romy from Arad, Romania. We drove three hours from Budapest to Arad and spent some time there, a couple days with Romy. Uh, learning about the culture and getting a little bit of jet lag taken care of, although we were only there for less than a week, so the jet lag never really went away. But uh, we did have a chance to kind of get to know Eastern Europe in a little bit uh, of a slice there in Arad. And I don't know how many of you have been to Eastern Europe before. This was my first time to go. What I discovered was that the contrast between the remnants of the old communist society and the now free society are very stark. If you know the history of Romania, Nicolae Ceausescu was the communist dictator there from 1965 until the revolution in 1989 when he was deposed and executed. And the country is still emerging from the shadow of this severe kind of oppression. You can see it in the architecture. You have old Soviet-style apartment blocks next to brand new uh, sparkling modern buildings there. Pastor Romy, whom we stayed with in Arad, took us around, showed us this stark contrast, which is really everywhere you look there in Arad. And it was here in the early 90s, after the revolution, that Randy and his wife Sue became exposed to the horrors of the Romanian orphanage system. Ceausescu believed that population growth would lead to economic growth. So he essentially forced families to have more children than they could care for, which wound up leading to more children, and these were then becoming wards of the state, essentially. The results were horrific. Children were warehoused in unkempt and crowded orphanages with none of the nurturing and care or even touch that was provided by a real family. If you look up Romanian orphanages online, you can see some of the horrific pictures of what it was like there. Randy and Sue adopted their daughter Anna out of one of these orphanages where she was especially set aside because she, like many of the babies in her ward, were HIV positive. Nobody wanted to even touch them. But Randy and Sue, Randy and Sue adopted Anna, brought her home. The doctors told her that she would live six months. She's now in her 30s. Despite the fall of Ceausescu and communism, the orphan crisis did not abate. Now, normally we think of orphans of those whose, uh, as kids whose parents have died, but that's not necessarily the case in Romania. Most of these kids have families. They just have families who do not want them. Many children are left abandoned to live on the streets. They're subject to exploitation and human trafficking. Many of the kids in the orphanages that we support are actually uh, ethnically Roma people. Now, you might know them more pejoratively as gypsies. These are people who, who their origins probably come out of India, but they migrated to Europe in the Middle Ages and uh, became kind of a wandering nomadic people. It's a culture that has long been rejected and harassed by Europeans. And so many of these children have been born into the world unwanted, unloved, 
and unwelcome. But it was the resurgence of real Christianity after the, fall, after the fall of communism that began to make a difference for these kids. Churches began to take notice, churches like Pastor Romy's, which essentially was uh, key in starting Honest House. And then there were other churches, like that of Pastor Christian Estrate, who's a young Methodist pastor in Sibiu, Romania, which is a beautiful little uh, medieval kind of city left untouched by this communist kind of uh, connection because Ceausescu's son liked Sibiu, liked to party there, so they didn't bulldoze it and rebuild it like they did most of the rest of the country. Now, I got to know Pastor Christie. We've talked a few times on the phone, but we spent a lot of time together driving in the car and walking around Sibiu. This guy is amazing. He makes me feel like a slacker as a pastor. He's into everything. He is uh, really enthusiastic, on fire for God and for this mission for these kids. And when Christie was setting up his church, he discovered that there in Sibiu, there were a lot of street kids who were coming to his ministry uh, called Super Kids Academy. These kids were coming for a meal, coming for some help, uh, coming to find a safe place to be for at least part of the day. And it was during this time that he discovered that some of the kids who were showing up were housed in a orphanage in Cornetel, just outside of Sibiu, a little bit outside of Sibiu in the country. And, and the story of how this orphanage came under the care of Global Hope and we became connected to them is rather interesting. So rather than me tell it, I'm gonna have Christy tell it to you. Let's roll that video. Yeah, we started the project in Sibiu called the Super Kids Academy and some of the children who are from this orphanage came to our program and we immediately noticed that they are not uh, very well kept and we were worried about them. And afterwards, uh, we found out that uh, they have management problems, they have resources problems, and the government was about to shut down the place. And the uh, owners who had this place came to us and said, please help us, because we saw your work and you, we saw that you, you care about these children. Um, we would like you to come and help. We were praying about it, and, um, and we decided to take over this place and uh, remodel the place and renovate. And we did that during the pandemic times, during the lockdowns. We, it was almost impossible at that time to create, you know, uh, fundraising events and stuff. But uh, I had an uh, uh, interesting uh, happening. What, when, whatever time I wanted to gather some funds, God just ran before me and he brought more. So whatever good I wanted to do in these years, God ran before me and he did for me. So I cannot compete with God in this uh, happening. And I, I know that this is a, a house of God, actually. And that's why we call this the house of joy. Just a brief glimpse of the House of Joy, where many of you have been uh, connected as uh, godparents to these, these kids. And I got to tell you, I instantly fell in love with this group of kids. There's 17 kids at the House of Joy. They were excited to greet us, to talk, to try out their English. They showed me their rooms proudly. Um, like kids like to show their rooms. They clean them obviously for our visit, but you know, nonetheless, they were, they were really excited to show off their rooms. In fact, it was very cool to go into their rooms and see how they had displayed and posted many of the letters that you all have sent and, uh, and cherish those. Uh, and they're learning to read them in English too. We got a, a chance to meet my, our goddaughter, Jennifer and I's goddaughter, Emma, there, um, who was in Sibiu uh, during the day while we were in the city. And uh, she had just graduated high school that morning, was going to her prom that night. And uh, like our Hannah, she's an artist. Uh, she's quiet, but she's starting art school at university in the fall. All that possible because of the House of Joy and making that possible 
for her. It was so cool to be able to meet her, to meet all of these kids. And uh, I delivered the packet of letters that you all put together, and uh, the kids opened them with great joy. They asked all kinds of questions about Colorado. They asked about the church. They asked about me. I told them my own story. And while my story is not anything close to what theirs is, um, I felt a kinship with them about uh, being connected to family that isn't necessarily your own, but to find a new family. I I got so connected that I had to be pried out of there after a couple of hours. They had to come find me because I was being shown all these kids' rooms and they they were looking for me because we had to move on to the next thing. It was a short trip. We had a lot of places to go. But what I saw there was what I think James is talking about, and that is pure religion. Kids who were abandoned, neglected, forgotten, warehoused are now thriving. They're focused on the future. They're looking forward to their lives. Many of those children who were orphans back in the early 90s and were rescued by these orphanages like Honest House are now growing up and they are becoming now in charge of the new Romania, all because some people took an interest in the orphan and those who are vulnerable. It's amazing what can happen in a child's life when they know someone cares, even if someone is doing it from a distance. I can see now why the Bible repeatedly talks about God's care for the orphan. I experienced just a bit of that kind of love and compassion. And when you experience it, you want more and more of it. Not just because it makes you feel good. I mean, that's a little bit self-serving. But because these children begin to feel like your own children when you're with them. They begin to feel to you like God must feel about all of us wanting us to have a home, wanting us to be loved, wanting us to thrive in safety and in purpose. Well, we spent just a few hours at the House of Joy, and the next day, we spent at least three hours a day in the car every day going to different places. We were covering a lot of the country. But we went up to the tiny village of Prod, uh, which is about three hours from the Ukrainian border. We were up in uh, the place where the kids from Kiev who were Ukrainian refugees evacuated from an orphanage there and brought to Romania are now being housed. These are also children that we have supported. Uh, We got that call about this immediate need. You all have responded more than $12,000 worth we've given so far for their care. But the story of how they escaped from the Ukraine and how they're being cared for by this ad hoc group of Christians who literally put this together in the middle of the night is pretty amazing. So I asked Thomas Krauss, who is the manager of Nehemiah House, to tell the story. So, hi, this is Thomas Krauss. I am uh, from here, from uh, Sibiu, Uh, born in Mediash, wonderful uh, city, but I actually live in Sibiu, where the NATO command center is now. And uh, yeah, when the war started, I uh, suddenly got a phone call late at night, I think it was 20 minutes before midnight, and uh, and a Romanian-Ukrainian person asked me, is this Thomas? I said, yes, this is Thomas. Uh, I heard that you have possibility to to host people from Ukraine. Do you have the possibilities to host an entire orphanage from Kiev? And uh, when I heard about it, I was expecting uh, to get a real challenge. Uh, together with my friend uh, Christian Istrate and, uh, and then I said immediately yes thinking about uh, this particular space here in Prod which is a remote, uh, a remote uh, village with only a wa- around 140 people living here but we now contributed significantly to, to the population and um, yes I immediately accepted it um, and uh, phoned the landlord here she also accepted and I said you know take the first uh, bus and then bring them over to Prod. So then they left Kiev uh, uh, almost uh, in the same the first week of the war uh, with the destination Prod, Romania. Uh, they arrived late that night, uh, but the driver took a bad turn and that uh, scared them a bit because they drove through hill country and um, and then they uh, did not enter the premises and then went uh, back to another Romanian town and then uh, through some concentrated effort uh, and uh, yeah, uh, insisting, you probably know part of the story, 
um, I managed to get them back. And they arrived uh, on Sunday, first week of the war. And uh, we received them in a warm house, which was uh, prepared for them. And since then we have we, we, we lived together here on this premises. Uh, the kids um, enjoy the large uh, garden, the yard, uh, our facilities here. Uh, we have uh, people come visit uh, and uh, do volunteering here. We have excellent food for them. And uh, yeah, we see also Lord's faithfulness that he keeps providing uh, resources and also wonderful people who come and bless these kids. Yeah, these are 28 kids from Kiev which is uh, from a center that used to be one of the best centers in the capital of Ukraine. Uh, but despite the fact that this has been the best center, uh, child placement center, the children actually come from the worst family situations that you can imagine. Uh, and this means an extra challenge for us to recover for a lost time and opportunity to contribute, to heal their memories and uh, to also bless them with uh, good education, with uh, uh, access to, to uh, good educators and uh, to, uh, to create the context where can, they can develop properly uh, to see the warmth of uh, a good, uh, yeah, God-loving community and at the same time to benefit from excellent social services. Yeah, and um, we are very thankful for for the work that uh, yeah, we can do as Global Hope uh, Romania now. Uh, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a Global Hope placement center, the first placement center for refugees ever in Romania. So uh, we are now on new grounds and Global Hope is, uh, has, now, has now created a precedence, uh, pre something without precedence in Romania. Uh, the government of Romania worked for this project. Uh, we had former prime ministers uh, go and actually do some work for, for this project here. And uh, many people found out about the work we're doing here and uh, they are thankful, they're sending regards and sometimes also resources to, in order for us to, to be uh, a help and a blessing for these kids. So you have kids who are doubly vulnerable, orphans and refugees, but they're safe and happy. They're living in this uh, Christian camp uh, in, I mean, R Prague is a tiny place and uh, you have to take a really bad road to get out to where they are, but they are safe and happy. And Global Co Hope is committed to care for them and has an agreement with the Romanian government to house them for up to three years or the duration of the war. Who knows how long that will be. But caring for them is a privilege. This is pure religion. And so what I experienced in Romania, meeting with these kids and, and having a lot of other experiences too over the short of just a few days, uh, was a revelation. The truth is that I'm pretty tired of religion in the American style. Washed through politics, concerned less about people than about positions. The pandemic intensified all that. Most of the pastors I talk to are depressed because we have had to deal with that for such a, a long extended period of time. But when I looked into the eyes of these kids, there was a new spark for me. I saw what Jesus was talking about, what James was talking about, what God is always talking about. And I think that's because this is the essence of the gospel, that we are all children in need of a home, that God invites us to be transformed from the previous life of estrangement and abandonment and pain and given new life. And Jesus provides the way, entering into that suffering with us, but then beautifully bringing resurrection, new life, hope, and a future. I don't think we'll ever understand the gospel, the true essence of Christianity, until we see it in the eyes of the orphan, the refugee, the most vulnerable children of God. Regardless of what is going on in the culture around us, this is a way that we can make Christianity Christian again. We have to get back to pure religion. So I'm ready to go back. I'm ready to go back tomorrow. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can take a team to Romania sometime this fall, and uh, we're looking at taking other teams in the future. I want you to experience what I experienced. 
and uh, to invest in the lives of these kids. There's a lot of work to be done. A lot of support is still needed. We're trying to figure out exactly what a team would do when we get there. One of the things that these kids really want is just someone to practice their English with because um, they're trying to learn that English and they want to practice it. There, there are small projects that need to be done. There are other things that we can support from here right now. For example, at House of Joy, uh, they have uh, a washing machine that you would have in your house, the kind that you would have in your house, except that they're doing laundry for 17 kids every day. And so they burn out a, uh, uh, a home washing machine about every three months. And so they're in need of a commercial washing machine and a commercial dryer. That's something we might be able to help with. If you'd like to contribute to that, it would be great. There are other things that are needed. For the kids at, house of, at Nehemiah House, they're hiring a full-time Ukrainian teacher to come and be with these kids and live on site. Right now, these kids are being educated online from teachers who are still in the Ukraine who are doing online lessons. Can you imagine uh, the bravery that that takes? But they're, they're continuing to send lessons. The kids have had uh, iPads donated and computers and, and handheld devices so that they can continue their schooling while they're there. So there's a lot of need. But what these kids really need more than anything else is just to know that someone cares about them. And so your prayers, your letters, your constant witness that someone cares for them with the love of Christ is crucial. Even small things make a massive difference. And so you're going to be hearing more and more about how we can continue to be involved in engaging this mission, this pure religion that Christ gives to us. To close, however, I want to share you th with this piece from Pastor Christie as a thank you for all that you as a congregation have done for these children. Let's go ahead and roll that. Hello and welcome to uh, the House of Joy Orphanage. I know that many of you helped and uh, support our ministry and also send letters to the children. We are here um, and we are glad that we can uh, show to Pastor Bob uh, the building and the kids and everything that's uh, surrounding this ministry. Um, I think that uh, taking care of the happiness of these kids we are taking care of our own happiness because in the moment we decide to give to others we we receive and this is a ministry that brings us a lot of joy and anytime we hear, the, hear a story of these kids uh, doing something great finishing their school or uh, starting to know more about god it's, it's just an incredible um, uh, news and also it makes us feel like parents you know and uh, this is like a parents environment we try to create an atmosphere where they feel like home close as, as possible and comparing with the years that we weren't here in those times they were fighting for their survival they, they thought that nobody will take care of them but during this year they told me we start to think about plans how to plan our life so it's a flourishing season for them and thank you for being part of this flourishing season and uh, seeding uh, in their life. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. God, we're so grateful that you give us the opportunity to be invested in the lives of the vulnerable. Help us, Lord, not to shrink back from that, but to step up and invest. Invest our lives, our prayers, our resources for the people that you care about. Thank you, God, for the ways you are doing that already. In the name of Christ. Amen.